Welcome to Central Community. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's going to be a fantastic day here at Central Community, whether you're joining us in worship in person, thank you so much for being here, or online this morning. I hope that you'll join in the worship, that you'll listen carefully to the message, that you'll take part with the card that's there online or here on the screen, that you'll be a part without you and your support. Throughout the pandemic, throughout the time coming out of the pandemic, throughout these days of health and the days where we were hurting so desperately, it would have been impossible. Thank you so much for your participation. Join us in this morning as we prepare for worship. The greatest day in history Death is beaten, you have rescued me Sing it out Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out. Jesus is alive. He's alive.
in our lives through whatever comes our way today. And so, Father, we thank you for the opportunity of this day. And today we come to celebrate, we come to rejoice of a victory through Jesus Christ our Lord in our hearts and our lives. That because of you, we can overcome the problems of this world and over problems of our own choosing, God. And today we can have you as that Lord and Savior. And so, Father, thank you for the blessings and the opportunity of life. And now as we go through this day, we'll have situations and problems. We'll have something that we'll have to deal with. And so, God, we ask that you give us the strength to go through everything in life, through the good things and through the bad things. And no matter what happens throughout our day, we thank you that you'll be there guiding our hearts and our lives. And for each of us as we come to this building or we come online right now, we just thank you that you're listening to our hurts, our longings, our desires, and help us to just be a little quiet at some point today and listen to what you're calling us to do today. And so, Father, we ask you to bless each person that is here, guide their hearts and lives, be with all the people throughout the world today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
My wife Debbie's been gone for the week. She's been back in Ohio for her 50th high school reunion. And it's, you know, I hope she had a good time. I haven't talked to her yet this morning. Hope everything went well. But I thought I would make use of some of the time with her being out of the house to go ahead and take advantage and be out of the house myself a little bit. So Wednesday, when I was down at Siempre para los Niños and we were done taking care of all the business, I decided to drive straight to San Diego, one of my favorite spots, get on a fishing boat and go fishing. Now, everybody else had the exact same idea. Somehow I got one spot on the boat, but the parking lots were completely full. This is not uncommon at the fishing landings. There were fishermen landings at, so the parking spots in front of H&M, in front of Point Loma, in front of fishermen's were all full. They have overflow parking lots, so overflow parking lots were completely full, and so the one-day parking, which is the final one down in front of restaurants, which you have to pay for with a credit card, which I've never been in in my entire life. A parking was my only and final resort. And so I pulled in there, I found one parking spot, it's big trucks, you know, fishermen, great big trucks, lined up trying to get a spot for parking. I found one spot, I pulled my car into that one spot with all my stuff backed out, ready to pack out, and it says you have to go over to this little machine to pay if you don't have the app on your phone, and I'm thinking just like I need another app on my phone, so I go over to the machine to pay, I put in the number, my parking spot, put in my license number, and it immediately says, that it's taking $18 from my credit card. $18 I have to park. Just, I'm already paying this much money to go fishing and now I have to pay 18 so I'm grumbling and I'm walking back to my car, complaining about all this and I look at it and the timestamp is good until 5.36 p.m. the following day. The boat doesn't get in until 6 a.m. Friday morning. And so I need an additional 12 hours, so I go back in, assuming I can readjust the whole thing, which you cannot do. Assuming I can cancel the whole thing and just get my money back, which you cannot do. So what I need to do now is I need to go ahead and buy two days of parking. You can't just add the one day beyond this. So I had to pay $36. Now I'm $54 in for parking. I've paid less for a week at LAX for my car, just for a day and a half of parking, and I'm not even on the fishing boat yet. When people say, oh, fishing's such a relaxing, <laughs> encouraging thing, you know, and it's a, don't buy it, don't believe it. I'm in the, I don't even have my rods and reels unpacked yet, and I'm already angry, thinking I'm out $54 just for part, have you ever had that day? I'm just curious. Is that something like that every, or does that kind of just sound like your days every day? I mean, does that kind of sound like, oh yeah, that's just what it is, Pastor Eric? Get over it. We're talking about peace. And one of the reasons I go fishing, because I love the aggressiveness, I love the excitement of it, but I also just love the peace that comes from the water. And this morning I want to talk about encouragement in those quiet moments of life. Because all too often, even a stupid computer with just a painted number on a piece of asphalt where we have to put our car, where we stick a credit card in, can suddenly have $54 gone out of our bank account and our peace is gone, our encouragement is crashed, and what we want to do is walk into the fishing landing and complain and walk away from any further you know, encouragement at all. But instead, we need to find a way to understand that is life always going to throw challenges in front of you every single day? I mean, are you going to have a day that doesn't have some kind of challenge? In fact, when you compare a $54 parking spot to the real challenges of life that happen in relationships, that happens in families, that happens in friendships, that happens when we're discouraged instead of encouraged, I mean, wouldn't you take the $54 parking spot almost every day of the week? I mean, it's just money, right? It's not what's happening in our real lives and in our relationships. And yet we allow everything else to come crashing down on us to the point that we're not very encouraging as people. And we struggle to find those quiet moments that allow us to be encouraging. The text for this morning is on the back half of your card. It begins with Jesus speaking. Jesus, I love it. He starts off with, so. I think anytime you could just start off with, so. 
You know, I mean, so, dot, dot, dot. You never know what's coming next. You know, when you're reading the scriptures, I would love to do a long breakdown on the Greek on this to come out with so, except that Jesus, we need to remember, wasn't speaking Greek. That was a translation from the Aramaic. Jesus was speaking Aramaic. I have no idea in the Aramaic how it came out with so. But I'm guessing it came out kind of like when someone looks at you and says, so. And they look at you and there's that great pregnant pause that you know is going to give birth to something good after that. If you are about to place your gift on the altar, we're going to have communion at the end of this service. If you're watching it line online at home, and if you'd like to prepare to have communion with us this morning, you might want to leave the message right now because we're going to close our service here this morning with communion, and you can do that at home as well. It says, if you're about to place your gift on the altar, and you remember that someone is angry with you, does it say if you remember that you're angry with someone else? No, it says... If you remember that someone else is angry with you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Make peace with that person. Then come back and offer your gift to God. See, so often what we do is we say, wait a second, I'm only accountable for my own anger. I'm only accountable for my own issues. But what if someone's angry with you? And you know someone's angry with you. And it says, what you need to do is you need to go and make peace with that person. Because what did Jesus say we covered last week? Blessed are the what kind of makers? The peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And peacemakers understand that if they're living in a world where someone's angry with them, well, it's their task to go out and make peace with that person. And well before you get on your knees and you come to an altar... And you say, oh yeah, I want to be in communion with the fellowship. I want to be in communion with Christ Jesus. I just don't want to be in communion with those people who are angry with me. That's not the way we're called to serve Christ Jesus. Jesus said, you know someone is angry with you. Make peace with that person. Then come back and offer your gift to God. You see, remember, we're to love God and to love others. And when we love God and we love others... That means before we come and we celebrate that love of God, we go out and we make sure that we're at peace with others because if we can't be at peace with other people, how in the world are we ever supposed to be at peace with God? And to pull that together, I love what James wrote when he wrote about it. He says, but the wisdom that comes from above leads us to be pure, friendly, gentle, sensible, kind, helpful, genuine, and sincere. There's eight different spots there. How many of you are happy if you just get one out of those eight each day? I mean, most of us, I mean, if I can get one out of those eight each day, I'm in pretty good shape. But imagine having every facet of your spiritual life together in a way that it touches your practical behavior on a daily basis. So that pretty soon your spiritual life is drawn together in a way that you can be pure, you can be friendly, you can be gentle. You're not kicking that parking machine that just robbed you for $54. You can be sensible, you can be kind. You're not yelling at the guy behind the desk who has nothing to do with the parking out front just because you're getting on the fishing boat who has to hear this from every single guy who's going fishing. You can be helpful, you can be genuine, you can be sincere. Who wants to have a whole lot of insincere friends? None of us, right? And yet how many of us tragically lead insincere lives? And we're not open and honest with everyone. And then he says this, remember we're talking about peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. James wraps it all up with this. When peacemakers plant seeds of peace, they will harvest justice. When peacemakers plant seeds of peace, and what are those seeds of peace? Pure, friendly, gentle, sensible, kind, helpful, genuine, and sincere. When peacemakers plant seeds of peace, they will harvest justice. What would a harvest of justice look like? We'll all find out someday. Someday when we meet God, we'll all find out exactly. I don't think we find out today. But I think it's kind of like Johnny Appleseed. Did any of you study Johnny Appleseed as a kid growing up? 
I mean the myth, the legend, or the reality of whatever it is. I grew up in Southern California, and so I really was never around apple trees at all. And then I moved to Indiana for graduate school. Did you know Indiana has apple trees everywhere? And people will actually point to apple trees and say, oh, that one. That one, we think, is from Johnny Appleseed. And you'd laugh, sure, you know, and they're serious. I mean, they believe this tree came. And in the fall, this time of year, the apples all begin to come ripe. And there's so many apples everywhere when you live in rural farmland Indiana that they're just falling on the ground in abundance. I thought to myself when I lived there, I grew up in the city of Los Angeles, but I grew up in, in an urban setting. I thought to myself, I have never seen so much waste in my entire life as what's going on here until I moved to Riverside. And I moved out in the middle of the orange groves. And I saw the oranges. And every single season of the oranges, whether it was Valencia's or whether it was Navel's, whether it was grapefruit, and they fell to the ground and they were everywhere. As a runner, it was perfect for me. All I had to do was run through the orange groves and they were everywhere. You got thirsty, you got hungry, all you had to do was grab something. It was like God provided for it. And I would think, here is this harvest of justice for everyone. Just to take, it was no different than the apple trees of Indiana. Imagine if with your life, Every, sing, you're, every single time you're pure, you're sensible, you're sincere, you're kind, you're gentle. It's like planting seeds, just like Johnny Appleseed planted all across the nation. Just going out, planting that are going to grow up. You may never see all of those trees. You may never <clears throat> get to enjoy that entire harvest. But someone will. Someone will enjoy a harvest of justice because you led a life of peace. Because you were willing to say, I long to be a peacemaker in my heart, in my home, in my life, with what I do. So on the front of your card this morning, it says step two is about encouragement. In those quiet moments, And so much takes place in the quiet moments of life. There's just no two ways around it. In those moments where you just never imagine. And some quiet moments can be the most frightening moments of all. When our son John was born, it was a totally quiet moment. December 18, 1983. He was born without any breath in him whatsoever. He was blue and with a cord wrapped around his neck several times. I remember Debbie lifting her head from where she had just given birth and saying, what's wrong, Eric? The doctor calling for all kinds of emergency stuff. And he's saying, just go up next to your wife and calm her down. And me praying, the biggest prayer I ever prayed in my entire life, God, protect this little baby. Help this little baby to survive. Just keep him safe. He's yours, God, not mine. We'll raise him up to be yours. Today, John's preaching his last sermon at Laguna Niguel Presbyterian Church, where he's been youth director for the last 12 years. Before that, for six years, he was youth director here. For 18 years now, he's been in the youth ministry, and he's accepted a full-time call to pastor Grace Presbyterian Church in Vista, California. And when he accepted that call, all I could remember was that silent, quiet moment where he didn't have breath in him. And now, God's using him in wonderful ways. They're celebrating John today at that church where believe, the average pastorate in America today is two years. It used to just be 18 months. John, some, for youth pastors, it's less than a year. John's been there for 12 years. He was here for six years. Before that, for 18 years, somehow he's managed. And now going to a senior pastor at a church that's only had two pastors, each of them over 35 years each. The pastor's at this church. And I think how God remains faithful. These quiet moments of encouragement that we step into and we don't understand, oh God, why do you want me to make peace with someone who's angry with me? If they're angry with me, God, isn't that their issue? Not my issue. God, why do you want me to be kind to people who are unkind? Why do you want me to be gentle in a world that's not gentle? Why do you want me to be sensible in a world that wants to rob me for $54 for parking? Why do you want me to take over in these kind of issues? 
as opposed to just lead a life of crashing down on the world around me. And it's because God wants us to be those who plant seeds of peace. And we don't always get to see the harvest, but the harvest of justice comes. Because that justice in God's hands, it's not in our hands. So it says there are three great reasons to plant peace instead of anger. More than three great reasons? Obviously. Way more than three great reasons. I'm condensing it down to three so we don't have to be here for the next three weeks. We're going to cover this three great reasons to plant peace instead of anger. First of all, anger divides. Anger divides. And it keeps us separated from God. I mean, how many of your best friends do you stay angry with for a lifetime? Don't tell me. I mean, most of us, anger eventually divides us. We stop calling people. We stop talking to them. We stop emailing. We stop texting. And pretty soon, we're just not even friends anymore. You say, oh, well, we're still friends. We're just not talking to each other. If you're not talking to each other, you're probably not friends anymore. That's an important thing to take note of. It's essential for us to understand that Jesus said that before you come and lay your gift on the altar, the Apostle Paul said this way, he said, examine yourself. Not so that you can know that you can be worthy, but so that you can know, am I ready to come and receive this communion, this grace from God? So if you're about to place your gift on the altar and you remember that someone is angry with you, you think, huh, is there someone that's angry with me? Is there someone that really has got a battleground issue with me? Fishing boat's an interesting allegory for life, and I know some of you get sick of my boat stories for a boat or my fishing stories, but I was on this fishing boat. We had slept all night on Wednesday night, woke up on the fishing grounds. I'd caught a fish or two. Not many people had caught fish on the boat. And then suddenly we were in a school of Dorado. Dorado are fun to be in. They jump everywhere. Many of you know them by Mahi Mai. They're really pretty fish. They're every, I mean, half day boats are catching them out of Newport and Long Beach right now. You ever wanted to catch a Dorado? They're everywhere right now, right off the Southern California coast. I woke up and I already had, had one in the bag and so I was good. And suddenly one of the crew members had this beautiful rod and reel. I mean, rod and reel like I will never own in my entire life. It, one of those things that you look at and say, man, this guy must be making good money. That thing's worth thousands of dollars. And he was hooked up with a Dorado, and the fish was just jumping, this blue color fish just jumping out of the water. And he held up the rod and reel and said, anybody doesn't have a fish yet, want to reel this in? Nobody said anything. He looked at me and said, mister, you want to reel this in? I said, I already have a fish. He said, well, that's okay, you want to reel this in? And I'm thinking, I just want to touch that rod and reel. I mean, that's all I was thinking, even more than I want. I had Dorado at home in the freezer from my last trip. I had a Dorado already down in the hull of this boat in their freezers. And I thought, sure, I'll take it. And it was so smooth. It was so fun. It was so nice just reeling that in. And then to get the Dorado to the boat, I had another, which is my limit of Dorado too. That's all you can take. And so I was suddenly excited. And then I felt like people were looking at me like, buddy, you've already got a fish. I could have reeled that in. And I felt guilty about it. I felt like, oh man, I've got an issue to make up with these people. They weren't there when the guy held up the rod and reel. I looked around for them everywhere. I would have gladly handed it off. But when the opportunity came my way, was I going to say no? <laughs> Not a chance. You see, there are people on fishing boats who say, well, unless I'm the guy who hooks it, I don't want to reel it in. That's not your pastor. I want you to know that if you hook a fish, you feel free to hand it off to me. You feel free to take care of it in that direction. For me, this crew member, he had it there, and I just got to think, ooh, what a pretty rod and reel. Ooh, what fancy equipment this guy fishes with. Ooh, this is so much fun. And I don't have that equipment. I just don't have that kind of equipment that this guy had. And for one fish... I got to have it in my hands, and I got to reel it in, and I got to think, this is really exciting. Now imagine you go to someone who's angry with you, and you say, you know, I'm just curious. It seems like our relationship's been strained, and I feel like you're angry with me, and I, I really don't need to get into whatever it is, the issues that are going on in our lives, but I want to tell you that I'm sorry that it's divided us. And whatever it is that you're angry me, at me about, I'd like us to fix it. 
I've been given grace from God, and I would like to be able to live in that grace. I don't want to be divided. And someone might think, well, I'm going to blow off all my anger on this person right now. I'm going to tell them exactly what the problem is. Or they might think, I don't know where they got that fancy rod and reel, this new heart that they're living with, but I need that in my heart too. And you plant the seed of peace and just going and walking away from the altar for a moment and saying, this relationship with the people around me is so important. I love the quote. What the quote says, it says, for every minute you remain angry, you give up 60 seconds of peace of mind. Most common sense thought in the world, of course. For every minute you remain angry, you give up 60 seconds of peace of mind. But I know people who carry anger for a lifetime without realizing it's their own poison that they're taking. They're giving up their 60 seconds of peace of mind that turns into a month, that turns into a year, that turns into a lifetime without peace. And it's hard to be a peacemaker. It's hard to plant seeds of peace unless you're willing to go out to that one who's angry and say, I don't know what the answer is, but I want us to make peace. Whatever I can do, I want to do it. Second great reasons to plant peace instead of anger is that loving relationships are key to our personal peace. Loving relationships are key to our personal peace. It says, make peace with that person. Make peace with that person, even when you're angry. Make peace with that person, even when you're alienated from them. Do you remember the eight points we covered on the back at the bottom of the card? Remember it says, be pure, friendly, gentle, sensible, kind, helpful, genuine, and sincere. Does it say angry in any of them? They say, oh, and you know, if you've got a righteous anger, I love people say, wait a second, but I have a righteous anger, just like Jesus had when he went into the temple. I have a right, you don't have anything like Jesus had when he went into the temple. None of us do. We have no clue what it was like to be Jesus to walk into the temple back then. Zero clue. And we have no clue what it's like to be righteous much less to carry a righteous anger that had any room to be judging anyone else. We just don't. But we can aspire to being sensible, to being kind, to being gentle, to being loving. And to do that, we need to make peace with that person because loving relationships are key to our personal peace. How many times did you think, finally, I've got some angry relationships, I'm at peace? When was the last time you thought, finally, I disagree with some people politically, I'm at peace. Finally, I disagree with some people over history in my life, I, I'm at peace. Finally, I beat them at Monopoly, I'm at peace. Finally, I got more money than them, I'm at peace. Finally, I've got a bigger house than them, I'm at peace. Finally, I've got a better car than them, I'm at peace. None of that gives you peace. What gives us peace is finally, I've got a good loving and relationship with these people. I don't have to think about what did I do to alienate myself from my children, from my grandchildren, from my neighbors? What did I do to become this human that I've become? I long to have peace. It says when we learn from experience the scars of sin can lead us to restoration and a renewed intimacy with God. I hate quoting Charles Stanley. Early in my ministry, I mean, people would always say, oh, pastor, I've got to get home because I love listening to you preach, but I go home and I watch Charles Stanley every Sunday on TV, and I would think to myself, don't do that. You know, then I, I, as a young preacher 30 years ago, I felt so threatened by all these people going, well, and I think to myself, well, the guy must have some stuff going on, you know, and I would read him, and I would think to myself about the message of peace that he would bring so often, but I think when we learn from experience that the scars of sin can lead us to restoration and a renewed intimacy with God. You know what? 
Because you're living in anger doesn't mean that you've alienated yourself completely with God, but what it means is that you're on the road to alienation with God. And is that the road you want to be on? I mean, one of the most famous sermons ever preached in early colonial America was a sermon titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And that's how people were drawn to God, saying, remember, you're just sinners, and you're in the hands of an angry God, and this is what you face. Man, I long to pursue a life that says what I want to be is loving, lifting up loving relationships. I want to be encouraging to the people around me. Imagine for a second that in this world of technology where the majority of you have smartphones now, that every morning you just took a, made the habit of five people on my smartphone contact list I'm gonna send a note of encouragement to. I got one of those notes this past week. It was such a sweet note. It really, it really meant a lot to me. It was, just, it was just a note of encouragement and telling me my value in this family and, and what I was worth. It was priceless. Now imagine if you just said, the appointments I'm going to make, just like last week we talked about making an appointment with God, I'm going to make an appointment with people in my contact list just to each day tell some of them what they mean to me. My brothers, my sisters, my mom, my dad, if you still have them, my grandparents, my grandchildren. Just to technically, this is what you my friends, the people I remember from school. Just let them know how they hit me just on a daily basis, just that note of encouragement. And as it reaches out and touches them, it begins to change lives as you plant seeds of loving relationships, seeds of peace for each person that we have to change. And finally, a third great reason to plant peace instead of anger is because peace makes the way for communion with God. Peace makes the way for communion with God. You want to have communion with God? It's about so much more than the grape juice and the bread. It's about the peace that we have. It's communion on a daily basis. It's the communion where we get to draw near to God. It says, then come back and offer your gift to God. And when we come back and we offer our gift to God, we think, is there something that I get to do? A young man who grew up in our church as from a little kid, both of his parents have died. They were good friends of ours. We love them. Um, they're gone now. He lives cross country. He and his wife visited yesterday. They're having to go through his parents' house and clean things out. Before he left, he did the most interesting thing. He's now a grown man, married, and he could be the most knuckleheaded kid in so many <laughs> times. And, and now he's making us so proud in so many ways. But he hugged me, and this is what he said. He just leaned into my ear and he said, Pastor Eric, is there something I can do for you? I didn't know what to say. I literally didn't know what to say. I mean, here's this kid. I, I, in my head, in so many ways, he's still a kid and he's a grown adult man taking care of all the things that you have to do now. His wife standing next to the car, Pastor Derek, is there something I can do for you? And I said, Chris, just you saying that was enough. That was enough. We fished that morning, and we caught those first few fish, and then the day went empty. The wind picked up. We drove around on a boat for hours and hours and hours with no more fish. And then the sun went down. We were only 10 or 20 miles outside of San Diego. And we came across some bluefin tuna. And we fished bluefin tuna from 7 at night until 1.30 in the morning. Because we were right next to the harbor. All we had to do was drive in. And the bluefin tuna were going crazy, breaking my arms, hurting my back, me an old man. And I, it seemed like every time I put a hook in the water, I was hooked up to a bluefin tuna and I was fighting one again. It was, it was just absolutely crazy, exactly the life you dream about as a fisherman. And all day long we had complained, and now we're in the middle of bluefin tuna like crazy. But there was this guy I'd talked to, a young guy, maybe in his 30s, named David. All day he had come, he had gotten on the boat, he lived in National City, he had rented a rod, he didn't have any tackle, he had the one hook on his rental rod that he'd paid $50 to rent. 
and he did not hook a fish all day long. I had told myself in my mind, if they're still fishing at midnight, I'm going to bed. About 12, 15, I'm still fishing, and I hooked another tuna. I'm hooked on these, and my arms are hurting, my back is hurting. I've been fishing since 6 o'clock that morning. Now it's 12, 15 the next day, and I'm hooked into another tuna. And here comes this David guy walking up the deck. I held up my rod and said, David, you want to reel in a fish? He looked at me and said, really? I said, yeah, come here. And I handed off my most expensive rod and reel, my nicest one, and I just gave it to him. I said, have fun, David. Reel it in. And I got to stand back. I should have asked for his phone, but I didn't, and videotaped it. But I got to stand back, and I got to watch him run up and down the boat as the deckhand stayed next to him. I got to watch him reel in. I felt so good about it. And then he got the tuna all the way up to it, and they gaffed it, and they brought it onto the deck, made that loud thump that a big tuna will make when it hits the deck. It was beautiful tuna scrambling everywhere. Then they looked up to me and said, what's your number, mister? And I said, well, it's his tuna. He looked at me and said, you mean I can have the fish too? He said, you reeled it in, man. And he gave him the number of his bag so that his tuna would be able to go home with him. And he handed me the rod and reel. He said, thank you so much. I want you to know, of, of the fish I caught that day, of every one of them I caught, most valuable one I remember is the one that I just handed a rod to David, and David reeled it in, who hadn't caught a fish all day long, a long, long day, and then caught a fish. Imagine you come to the end of your life, and there are people that you still haven't made peace with, because you think to yourself, well, they're angry with me. I'm not angry with them. That's their business, not my business. What if you just went out of your way and said, I want to make peace with these people? Even if it cost me my most expensive rod and reel, even if it cost me that big, beautiful tuna on the end of the line, even if it cost me what I paid to come out of here, I want to make peace. And, you know, it would be easy for me to say, well, David hasn't paid the dues. He hasn't been on enough boats. He's got rental rods. He doesn't know what it's like to buy the right equipment, to have the right, all that kind of stuff. Or I could just say, here, have fun. Enjoy yourself and watch him get brutalized and do it, and then realize this is the truth. My arms and back hurt so much from reeling in fish, they didn't hurt at all while he was reeling them in. I got to celebrate, and my heart was light. When we encourage people, not so that anybody else sees it, not so that we're doing it from the front of the crowd, but we're just living as an encouragement, we're planting seeds of peace. And those eight impossible characteristics of a Christian on the back of the card. I mean, to be pure, friendly, gentle, sensible, kind, helpful, genuine, and sincere. They suddenly become reality in our lives. And we may not recognize it, but other people recognize it. There's a guy in National City, maybe even eating tuna with his family today. Tuna for the whole week ahead. And talking about this old man who handed him a fishing rod and just said, here, reel it in and telling the story. And someday, my hope would be he'll do the same, because just the seeds of peace were planted in him. Such it is with life. We're going to share in communion in just a minute. As we share in communion, you have the opportunity to come forward and get on your knees here at the altar. And we're not going to use this piece of bread, but this came from one of our food donations in the past week. And I looked at it and I thought, that looks like, just like one of those Jesus loaves of bread. And I said, Ken, set one of those aside. I just want to use it because it said Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he shared with his disciples. And then it says he took the cup and he shared it after blessing it so that his disciples could come and be at peace. Do you want to be at peace with God this morning? It start with being at peace with others. You don't know how to be at peace with those who are angry with you? It begins with encouragement. That word of encouragement, that word of handing off that which you've treasured and aspired towards, and saying, I want us to be at one, together. Atonement. You know, atonement, when you spell it, at one minute. It's what it literally means, at one minute, for us. Say, I want to be at one with God, at one with others so that I can atone. Heavenly Father, we lift up the cup this morning that represents your blood that was spilled out for the sacrifice of our sins. We lift up the bread this morning that represents your body that was broken for each one of us. We would ask that you would build your church, God, 
by making us people who live with encouragement. In the quiet moments when no one's noticing, when maybe no one's watching, maybe in the middle of the night, God, where we just have the opportunity to text someone, to call someone, to reach out and help someone and restore hope where before angry, anger divided us from that person and from you. Lord Jesus, right now, we thank you so much for the invitation to live out the lives that you've called us to lead, God. Help us to be pure, sensible, kind, gentle, to be encouragers in the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come when you're ready to share. pastoring today. Um, John went through multiple surgeries after that. John went through so many challenges. John could be such a knucklehead as a teenager, <laughs> thing, thing after thing that went on, but it required a church to love him all the way through it. And when John was thanking people on Facebook, he thanked Pastor Ken's leadership in his life, and he thanked all the people 
I mean, he, it would be impossible to name all those people. But there's a reason why someone goes this direction. It's not just because their dad said a prayer when they're born. It's because there's a fellowship of peace that surrounds them, that raises them up. And for us, we have the opportunity to be those people who are fellowship of peace. So you are so invited to be a part of that for the years to come. And I hope that you'll visit John's church <laughs> at some point. I look forward to it. I've not gone there yet. Um, ministries and events are on the back of the card. That's your announcements for the week to come. Jack's for Jesus going to the streets of Los Angeles tonight. You are so invited. I have no clue what Jody's cooking, but there will be something that will be taken to the streets of L.A. tonight. They'll be cooking. If you don't want to go to the streets of L.A., you don't have to come and serve the homeless with us. You can serve them in the kitchen right here at Central Community starting at 3 o'clock. You can prepare. You can work with good and godly people over there. Um, Sunday school is at 10 a.m. Trisha's back there. Trisha heads up our Sunday school ministry at 10 a.m. Please bring your kids. I know they're learning about Moses this week, so they're learning the lessons of the Old Testament. My grandchildren were in class the other day, and they came home with lessons about Sodom and Gomorrah, and I said, Ken, I'm going to have to write Sunday school curriculum all just about Jesus loving people, you know. So anyway, all kinds of good lessons from the whole Bible that are coming to it. Um, women's Bible study resumes on September 6th. Um, that's coming up real quick, amazingly, just like that. The summer has come, the summer has ended. And um, the women's Bible study resumes then. You're welcome on Tuesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. Food preparation and distribution. While I was fishing, the team was out picking up food. And so they were hard at work on that on Tuesday. The team will be packing all of that food. We'll pick up some more food. Last week, we ran out of food by what? 9.15 or something like that, 9.20? We were out completely and we were prepared for hundreds of families. We ran out of food the week before that. We were prepared for hundreds of families. So people are in desperate need right now. People are in desperate need. They're coming more than ever right now for food. And so you can be a part of that. The packing team will be Tuesday morning. And then Wednesday morning, starting at about 6 o'clock, you can be here and you can help Pastor Ken set up. You can help the team that sets up. And then at 8 o'clock, we'll start distributing it. You are welcome to be a part of all of that. Siempre para los niños, our orphanage in Tijuana. I was there Wednesday afternoon. You are so welcome to be a part of everything we're doing at Siempre para los niños. Some money came in that just at the last minute enabled us to be able to pay payroll this last week. I mean, otherwise, we were just like at the cutters, cutting edge of it all. I'm fortunate. I don't take care of the money. Thank you, Pam, for taking care of all of that part of it for us. And Pastor Ken, who ties in with Pam on those things. Me, all I do is beg. And I get to go down and hug the kids. But the kids were celebrating going back to school, celebrating after a long pandemic, being out of the classroom, being out of uniforms, and now getting back in uniforms, going back to school, and doing all of those things that kids get to do. Um, it's such a blessing. Thank you so much for your part in it. Anytime you would like to participate in sharing it, just let me know. We would love for you to be a part of what's going on at St. Pray Parlos Nunez. May God richly bless you and your household and your home in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the days to come. Thanks for being here today.